Good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's good and it's bad to be here with you once again. It's good because I'm happy to be with you. It's a little bit bad because I think this is the last in our, in our time together during this season, during this week of prayer. And uh, so uh, this afternoon, I'm going to be, I, don't, I think I'm going to be fairly, fairly brief, but I want to uh, just share a few things that, were, that are on my heart uh, to share with you uh, about the work that is before us, about the situation that we're in. Um, all week, if you've been listening to the messages, uh, each message I've been really burdened or led to share with us that it is not time for business as usual. You've heard me say that a few times throughout the week. This is not the time for business as usual. This is not the time for work as usual. And, you know, it's, a, it's such a very interesting thing. We're all very familiar with, I think, we've all heard the stories of this great ship called the Titanic. Um, this is a ship that was built and it was claimed that this ship was going to be unsinkable. It was built to, with uh, reinforced and with, I think it had double hulls on the ship and people claimed this ship could not be sunken. It could not be sunk. And on its maiden voyage, on its trip uh, to Europe, some of the wealthiest and most celebrated people in America boarded that ship. Sh certain that they would make it to the other side. There's been a major motion picture that was created about this voyage, I think something like 20 years ago. And it's very interesting when that ship was sailing, people were so confident in the ship that when the ship struck an iceberg, I'm sure everyone felt it, but no one worried. Everyone heard the sound and everyone felt the, the vibrations of the ship as it scraped against the iceberg, but uh, no one noticed very much, no one took great care, no one took serious concern because they knew that they were on a ship that was unsinkable. And of course, when the alarm finally went out and people heard that, you know, it's time to go to the lifeboats, uh, many people still, the stories told, many people still did not listen, they did not believe, they did not understand about the seriousness and the urgency of the situation around them. Oh, my friends, we are in a similar, similar situation. And it is difficult for us because we know, and, and I think sometimes it's even more difficult for members of the Adventist church because here in the Adventist Church, we know that we are standing on a very firm foundation. The truths that we have come to understand from the Word of God, this is the Word of God. There's nowhere you can find in the teachings of the Adventist Church that it's just, well, a person said this. Oh, a, a tradition said that. Everything that we have come to love and trust and believe has come directly out of the Word of God. And we know that the Word of God shall not fail. It shall always stand. 
Ellen White even makes the statement, I'm going to paraphrase here. She says, it will even appear at some point that the church will fall. That the church is not going to make it. There will be a shaking and there will be problems and it will look very much like the church will fall. But she says the church shall not fall. She says that the church is the object of Christ's highest affection. And so when you hear these kinds of statements coming from Sister White, when, you, when we look at into the face of Christ himself, when we understand that we are standing on the word of God, it, it, it seems like there really should be no problem. And yet, and yet, we are standing at the end of time. And there is a, are several passages in the beginning of the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, where the Lord gives the church an evaluation. And the church of the last days, just before Jesus arrives, is a church that is in a very precarious, very desperate, very serious situation. They're in a serious situation, but they don't know it. You see, they're in a serious situation because they know that they are standing on the truth. They know it. In fact, Jesus confirms. This is uh, taken from Revelation chapter 3 <clears throat> and verse 15. Jesus is speaking to this church and he says, I know your works. And he says that you are neither cold nor hot. They're not cold. They're not deceived. They're not out in darkness. They're not believing things that are not the truth. No, they have taken time and they have studied and they have understood the truth. They know the word of God. They're not cold. They're not like so many people who have religions that are not really focused on the creator of heaven and earth. They're not saying there is no God. They're not in rebellion against God. They're not saying, well, we know the word of God says this, but our traditions say something else and we would prefer to be with our traditions. They're not saying that either. They're saying, no, 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 we reject everything else. But the thing that we believe in, the thing that we trust in, is the word of God itself. Hallelujah. Amen. They're not cold. You can't pick at their theology. You, cannot, you can't dismantle their doctrine. All of it is on a firm and very sound foundation. My friends, I hope and pray that you are on that firm foundation. That you are believing in the words of Christ and Christ alone. But Jesus goes on. He says they're not cold. He says, but they're also not hot either. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to be hot. And I hope and I hope and I pray that these are not just another set of words for another Sabbath afternoon program. I, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit is going to get a hold of us before it is too late. You know, there were people in, in my country in, in, uh, in America back in the year 2001. You remember September 11th, 2001, and there were people in those high-rise buildings, the, the World Trade Center, who just could not get themselves to believe that the fire that was in the building was so serious that they needed to urgently leave their work and rush, not to the elevators, but down all of those stairs. And they delayed, they made phone calls, they continued to do work. Many of them were told by officials, by their supervisors, by their boss, don't worry, the fire departments are on their way, it's not a problem. These buildings were designed to withstand uh, different problems and this should be okay and so people waited 
My friends, we cannot wait. It is far beyond, it's far past the time to wait. And I'm gonna be a little bit alarmist here if I may. Just forgive me. Uh, but I feel like if I don't try to make things clear, then, uh, then maybe I'm not really doing my work. But I, and, and it's not my work, it's our work. We're in this together. I need you. I need my church to rise up and to wake up and decide that the work before us is urgent. It is alarming and it is not worth leaving. It's, it's not worth waiting even one moment. We must urgently move. Jesus says that they're not cold, but they're also not hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. But he's saying you're even in a worse situation than if you were cold. He says, because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. People who are cold, they're simply unprepared. But people who are lukewarm are actually rejected by God. Don't have the truth. Do not know the truth. And then do nothing with it. It's a far more dangerous, far more serious situation to be in. Jesus says, all of this is happening because, verse 17, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and, I, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you, you, you who believe the truth, you who have the correct doctrines, you who have the right understanding, you who have rejected the traditions of men, you, we have become wealthy and have need, uh, say that we're rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and we do not know that we are wretched, that we are miserable, we are poor, we are blind, we are naked. Jesus says he counsels us to buy from him gold refined in the fire that we may be rich. Not just thinking that we're rich, we need to become wealthy in Christ. How do you become wealthy? You become wealthy by storing up your treasure where? In heaven. And as I visited many places around the world, around Kenya, around East Africa, many places, I, I'm sorry to say, and I wanna say it clearly with, with love and compassion for you and for me, I am not seeing a seriousness that respects the time in which we are living. I'm not seeing it. There should be alarm. There should be a sense of urgency for the lost around us. We need to be storing up our treasures in heaven. There's too many, there are too many members of the remnant church of God who are still planning on marrying and giving in marriage and so forth, and I'm not saying anything against marriage. I'm talking about the general spirit, the attitude of the times within the church, right? If you're engaged by God's grace, if the Lord has called you together, please get married, okay? I have no problem with that. But if you get married, you need to understand God is calling you together in an unusual time. The, the Lord's return is on the, at the very door and your marriage should be unlike any other marriage you have ever seen in the world. Because you're called to an urgent task. The time is gone where we are going to just marry and give in marriage and buy houses and land and cars and seek for jobs and do the various things that the world does and, 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 and just grow old doing those things and that's it. No, the time, my friends, is far, far spent. This is not a long message. But if it was a long message, I think I could try to explain to you, 
to us. Why? Truly, the time is far spent. There is not much time left. And the Lord says, that we should uh, buy from him gold refined in the fire, refined through trials and challenges, through persecution, through sacrifice, refine the faith that you have. Are you sacrificing? Are you being persecuted? Are there challenges because of your faith, because you refuse to keep quiet, because you refuse to be reasonable, because your love and compassion for those around you is so great. You must speak to them in the name of Jesus. That you must serve them in the name of Jesus. You must give your all, your time, your finances, your expertise. You must give urgently. Are you refined in the fire? Or are you comfortable? Am I comfortable? My friends, I, there are so many Seventh-day Adventist members who are comfortable. And if we are comfortable, the church that is called by God to deliver an urgent message about the urgent times, imagine everyone else. My friends, let us rise up and be the church that God called us to be. I'm going to jump down for the sake of time. I want to... Go to verse 19. Jesus says, as many as I love, because I love you, Jesus says, I rebuke and I chasten. I'm not going to sit here and tell you how well you've done when you have not. When you have been far too complacent. When you, like the ten virgins in the story, have fallen asleep. Jesus says, I'm not going to cradle you and coddle you. I'm going to warn you. I'm going to rebuke you. And I'm going to chasten you. I'm going to severely, urgently encourage you to wake up and not go through the motions of whatever our Adventist culture has developed into. We need to let that go. We need to let it go. My friends, the three angels' messages have been here in Kenya for more than 100 years. This is an urgent message that's been being proclaimed for more than 100 years in this nation. My friends, time has run out. We cannot afford another 100 years. There are 50 million or so people living in this nation And in many places in this country, Adventism is viewed as a tribal religion. It's for this tribe, it's for that tribe. We don't know anything about that in our culture. My friends, what have we done with God's message? Jesus says this, finishing verse 19, therefore, Therefore, as a result of all these things he's told us, that we're lukewarm, we're in danger of being vomited out, he's counseling us, he says, therefore, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be zealous and repent. You who know the truth, you who understand the doctrines, you who understand the word of God, first, we need to repent and then be zealous. You know, I wanna change the word zealous because it's, not a, it's only a word that we ever hear when we're reading this verse. But I think the appropriate word that kind of maybe would call us to attention here is the word um, extreme. Jesus is saying, don't be complacent, Don't worry about it. I, the the authority, the one in whom all authority has been entrusted, I am telling you, be an extremist. Love with extreme passion. Love with extreme uh, compassion and care. 
We need to urgently give this message. As I shared on Sunday, last Sunday, this city is, going, is about to grow by more than 5 million people in the next 25 years. 5 million people. That means more than 200,000 people every year. That means this month there will be more than 16,000 people moving into this city. This city will be growing by 16,000 people. The last time I checked, we had maybe 200,000 members in this city of over 5 million people. 200,000, but we've got 5 million people in this city. And the city is adding 16, more than 16,000 people every month. That is more than 550 people Every day, today, this city has grown by 550 people. And what are we doing? What are we doing? What not only are we doing, but what is it that you are doing? You personally. I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm not doing enough. If these were your children, that were lost. If your children were on the Titanic, if your children were in those burning buildings in New York 22 years ago, what would you do to get your children out of that building? What would you do to warn your children to leave that ship while they can? My friends, this city is in an urgent, urgent situation. This nation is in an urgent situation. And just like it was the, on the Titanic, as the ship was literally sinking, people were in the ballrooms listening to music and dancing and enjoying their meals. My friends, the time for us to have the fellowship and the faith that we've always had is long over. Let me read to you From Sister White, Ellen White writes, a great work is to be done. She says, I am moved by the Spirit of God to say to those engaged in the Lord's work that the favorable time for our message to be carried to the cities has passed by, has passed by. And this work has not been done. She says, I feel a heavy burden that we shall now redeem the time, that we're going to wake up and work extra hard to make up for what has not been done. My friends, in your life, in your life, never mind your brothers and sisters around that are here with us today. Ask the Lord in your life, is anybody saying this person is an extremist? They love Jesus too much. They're, they're talking about Jesus too much. They're praying too much. They're giving too much. They're serving people too much. Is that what people are saying about you? Is that what they're saying about you? And if it's not what people are saying about you, then I'm suggesting to you very directly, there is a problem. There's a problem. Don't, it is, this is not the time for the world to think that you're reasonable and everything is, no, my friends, we need to love, we need to give, we need to serve in an extreme way. Ellen White says, the days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Plagues and judgment are already falling upon the despisers of the grace of God. The calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarms of war are portentous. They forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude.
She says, my brethren, enter the cities while you can. In the cities that have been already entered, there are many who have never heard the message of truth. Can you believe there are people here in Nairobi who've never heard this message? Never heard it. Not sure exactly how old this church is. But I'm, I'm saying, this church, this is the mothership, I think, church for Nairobi. Am I right? I think that's right. This is the, the, the preeminent church in this city. Who's responsible for reaching this city if not this church, if not you as a member of this church? And there are people in this city who've never heard. Listen, I guarantee you, if we put our minds together today, we could come up with a plan. You could come up with a plan to make sure that at least no Nairobian would be unaware of the three angels' messages. Let me ask you this. If, if, if Christ came here and he said to you, listen, today the city is growing by 550 people. If, if there was an opportunity that I could give you, but it would cost you everything, but it would cost you everything, people would talk about you, people would your reputation would, would suffer, your bank account would be emptied, and you would be struggling and suffering along with the least of these in this city. But if you give me your everything today, I can guarantee you these 550 people that the city is growing by today, I can promise you my Holy Spirit will reach them and will offer them the gift of eternal life. They will not suffer. They will not die without having a clear choice. They'll have the opportunity to be saved. And many of them will take that opportunity because they will see your sacrifice. They'll see how seriously you have taken this message. And many of them will be in my kingdom for eternity. I, I don't want to make it difficult and I don't want to tempt anybody to raise their hand when they don't feel that way. But I want you to tell the Lord whether or not you would be willing to give everything for that mission, for those 550 people. And the truth is that there are some of us here that would not. And I praise God because I believe that there are some of us here that would and that will. God wants to use us, but the time for business as usual, church as usual, is long over. And we are not in an arc of safety because the other members around us don't seem to be feeling very urgent. Well, you know, they all heard Pastor Pelode as well, but, he, you know, everybody else seems to be doing the same things. Well, I guess next week we'll just see what happens at church next week. Do not be fooled by that. When God calls you, he is calling you. And he wants you to come no matter what anyone else says. No matter, no matter what anyone else does. If the Lord is calling you, you need to fall on your knees and ask him, Lord, here am I. Send me. Lord, whatever it takes, I will go. These are urgent times. These are urgent times. I'm telling you, I, I had, and I'm not speaking out of nothing here, and I'm not saying I'm in any way a good person or anything like that, but I am telling you, I know what it is. As I mentioned the other night, you know, I was a very comfortable software developer running my business, doing well, children were doing well, everything was fine, but the Lord said, no, you need to go. Don't think it will ever be easy. The, Lord, the Holy Spirit is not going to fall on you in such a way that doing his will is going to be easy. It's going to be an obvious, oh yeah, of course, Lord, let me go do this. You're not going to be filled with so much passion and so much joy in the Lord that you're just gladly going to go skipping along and sacrifice everything for, for the Lord. You will not. Even Jesus himself didn't want to go. 
But he was forced to say, because of his love for humanity and his love for the Father in heaven, he said, not my will, but yours be done. Everything around you, everyone around you will be calling you in a different direction. But the test of the Holy Spirit is, will you listen to me, he says. On Sabbath afternoons, I hope that we'll take the opportunity. All of us, as Seventh-day Adventists, the Lord has given us a whole 24 hours where we can work together. The Bible says in Acts 2 that when they were all together in one accord, that is when the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And then they went out and they shared the gospel with the multitudes. We are very blessed. Every week we have that opportunity. So we cannot afford to spend all day, every Sabbath day, amongst ourselves. There's a city out there that needs you. There's a city out there that needs you every day of the week. And I'm here to tell you that no matter what your plans are for your life, no matter where you've been investing, whether it's your career or financially or in your family or what have you, my friends, there is no better and no safer investment than to store your treasures in heaven. Do not be complacent. If everyone around you decides to stay in the ballroom of the Titanic, if they want to stay at their desk at the World Trade Center, you go. You go. Be zealous, therefore, as Jesus has said. What does it look like for you to be zealous? For you to give all that you have so that there is nothing left undone. So that you can say, I have finished the, ra the race. I have run the course. My friends, I need my church to wake up so that even I can be more and more on fire. Let us encourage one another. There is a world out there that needs us. The Lord is willing to give you this city. This is one of the greatest cities in the entire continent of Africa. And the Lord will give you this city so that from here you will reach the rest of this continent and even the world. He is willing to give it to you. My friends, all you have to do is sincerely ask. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that Jesus is soon to come. Lord, what, what a joy. God, where there will be no more tears, there will be no more sorrow. God, that we will live in a perfect city, a perfect kingdom, the earth made new. Lord, I thank you for that. There'll be no more crime, no more corruption. No more death. God, we are looking forward to that day. Now, Heavenly Father, no one's looking forward to it more than you are, Lord, because you want to see your children with you for all of eternity. And right now, God, there are millions and millions of your children who do not yet know you. And they can't see you so many millions in this city have not even heard your message. And, and when they meet us, Lord, there's, there's, there's not enough about us to make them know that you are coming urgently, that you are coming soon. Lord, I want to invite you. I want to invite you, Lord, to give us your Holy Spirit in a fresh, new way. 
God, whatever we have been doing, as nice as it is, it does not represent how hot you are willing to make us in the faith. Lord, you're willing to take us much farther. The plans we have for our lives are nothing compared to the plans you have for us. Your plans are exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we would even ask or imagine. But God, please, Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. Help our unbelief. Because, Lord, while we believe in your word, while we believe that you're coming soon, Lord, the truth is, God, we are afraid to take a step. We're afraid to look different. We're afraid to do something that when no one else is moving, Lord, we don't want to be the first to stand up and walk to the front. We don't want to be the first to go and sell all that we have and give to the poor and come and follow you, Lord. God, we're listening to the world around us, our family around us, our friends around us. More than we are hearing your voice, Lord God, please, please, have compassion on us. Help us to hear your voice urgently and clearly before it is too late. Lord, this is not only the call for salvation for the city, but it is the call for our own salvation. You said through Sister White that, that more than 95% of us are not ready to meet you because even though we are members of the church, we're working harder to fit in with the world and succeed in our life on this, in, on this earth than we are working for your kingdom. Lord, it's not easy to stand out. It is not easy to be different. Lord, I'm asking you, please, help me to be different. Lord, my brothers and sisters that are here listening right now, Lord, I pray with all the sincerity and all of the passion that I know how to pray with, Lord God, I pray right now for a Holy Spirit revival. God, I'm asking that you will fall on them. Lord, I'm asking that you would awaken every single one of us. Lord, I pray that you will trim our lamps. Fill us with your oil, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will remove all fear and all doubt, Lord. Give us all faith and all confidence to do everything we can for the glory of your name. Lord, change us and use us to call this city to righteousness, Lord. Let us be an example to the other church members around us who may never move until they see us moving urgently with extreme passion for your glory. Help us, Lord. I praise you for Nairobi Central Church. You have used it to bless this city in so many ways. Now, Lord, on the brink of your return, Lord, call this church even higher to rally the Adventist movement in this city and in this nation to do the mighty and necessary work of proclaiming your message urgently so that you may return and welcome millions of your children here in Nairobi, home with you. I praise you, Lord. We're not praying this prayer in vain. There's not one person that's here today that is here by accident. You have called and chosen the ones you wanted to be here to hear this message. And Lord, I know that you will use them. You'll use us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.